the life of our holy monastic father James the ascetic, who fell and repented. In the man who loves God and lives in accordance with the Savior's commandments, humility is the wellspring of luminous virtues. Because he neither relies on his own strength nor thinks highly of himself, the genuinely humble man does not sink into despondency if he sins. Pride, to the contrary, is the ruin of the heedless, burdening them with vain cares and doing them irreparable harm. These truths are taught by many holy books, and especially by the present account, which instructs those who lead a heavenly life on earth to be vigilant, and him that thinketh he standeth to take heed lest he fall. This narrative provides excellent guidance, an illustration of humbleness, and an example of a quick, vigorous arising from a stumble into sin. From it we learn the power of repentance, which stirs the benevolent master to deliver the wrongdoer from the gates of hell and tortures of Gehenna. With the aid of divine grace, the penitent can attain a state of virtue superior to that which he enjoyed before lapsing. And so, let us begin our story. In Phoenicia, near the town of Porphyrionis, there lived a monk named James. Having renounced the vanity of this temporal existence, he took up his dwelling in a cave where he lived for fifteen years. So harsh was his asceticism and lofty his virtue that God granted him authority over demons and power to heal in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Everyone marveled at James's holiness, and crowds of both the faithful and Samaritans thronged to him. Being clairvoyant, the Lord's favorite knew who were the unbelievers and instructed them from the divine scriptures. He converted many to the Christian faith. At length, the devil, mankind's ancient foe and the hater of all Christians, struck back at James. Put to shame by the saint's good deeds and perfect life, the evil one laid his traps, hoping to ensnare the man of God and remove him from the cave. He entered into an unbelieving Samaritan living in Porphyrionis, as he once entered into Judas, and incited him to drive out James. The Samaritan assembled all his relatives, friends, acquaintances, neighbors, and servants, and with them went to the house of the accursed priest of their religion. A meeting was held, and all agreed that since James had converted many Samaritans to Christ, he must be expelled from the region. After much discussion, they also decided to allot twenty pieces of gold for hiring a woman of ill repute to seduce the hermit. Her money was to be doubled if she succeeded, as this would leave the Christians no choice but to allow the Samaritans to drive out James in dishonor. Late one night, James heard a knock at his door. It was the harlot begging him to let her in. When the Blessed One refused, she redoubled her pleas. Finally, the saint opened the door and looked out. Certain that she was an apparition, James crossed himself and slammed the door in her face. Then, turning to the east, he fervently besought God to drive away the demon tempting him. But hours passed, and the woman was still knocking and crying, Have mercy on me, true servant of the living God. Open, lest the beasts prowling outside your cell devour me. After considering how the woman might indeed be attacked by predators at such a late hour, the venerable James again looked out. He asked, Where are you from, and why are you here? I live in a convent of virgins, and was sent by the abbess to the city, replied the woman. Night fell as I was returning, and I lost my way. Somehow I found your cell. I beg you, man of God, have mercy on me, and do not permit me to become prey of wild animals, but let me in. I will be gone at sunrise. Moved by compassion, the godly James allowed the woman to enter and offered her bread and water, then retired to his inner chamber, leaving her in the outer room. After eating, the harlot rested a little. Presently, she began feigning illness, weeping piteously, moaning, and entreating the saint's help. James looked through the little window on the inside door, and thinking she was sick, wondered what to do. The harlot begged, Father, show mercy and come trace the sign of the cross on me. I have terrible pain in my heart. Hearing this, the saint brought a burning lamp and holy oil to the woman. While heating his left hand over the lamp, he traced a cross and oil on her heart with his right hand, then rubbed in the oil with his warm fingers. Burning with unclean desire and hoping to corrupt the Blessed One, the horse said, Please, Father, keep putting on oil and warming my breast so that it will stop hurting. Being simple and guileless, James had no inkling of her plan and did as she requested. Nevertheless, he knew how the cunning demons stir up carnal warfare and he feared lest, while showing kindness to the woman, he bring about the perdition of his own soul. Repeatedly returning his left hand to the lamp for a period of two or three hours, he held it so close to the flame that his fingers burned off. By extreme pain, the Blessed One averted every demonic suggestion, not accepting a single unclean thought. 
Seeing what James had done, the harlot was moved to compunction and threw herself at his feet, weeping. Woe is me, the debauched, blind one. Woe is me, the abode of the devil. The saint was taken aback and said, Rise, woman. He lifted her from the floor and, after a fervent prayer, demanded, Tell me why you came here. With difficulty, she composed herself and explained that, beholding him lead an angelic life, the impious Samaritans, or rather the devil himself, had paid her to seduce him. The venerable one sighed deeply, and tears falling from his eyes, thanked God for delivering him. He instructed the woman and blessed her, then sent her to the holy bishop Alexander. The woman confessed all her sins to the bishop who catechized her. Convinced that her repentance was true, the bishop without delay illumined her in holy baptism and entrusted her to a convent of virgins where she was betrothed to Christ. After this, he assembled his clergy and all the Christians and expelled the entire Samaritan population from the town and surrounding region. He summoned the blessed James and, offering paternal counsel, encouraged him to continue leading a godly life. With the help of the Lord's grace, the former harlot pleased God and was granted authority over demons. It came to pass that an unclean spirit entered the daughter of a certain wealthy nobleman, and the girl began to cry out the name of the Lord's favorite. Her parents brought her to James and begged him to show mercy and drive out the unclean spirit. The saint prayed to God and laid his hand on the maiden, and straightway the Lord's power expelled the demon. When they saw their child in her right mind, the parents thanked God. In token of their appreciation, they sent the man of God three hundred pieces of gold. The righteous one not only refused the money, but would not even look at it, saying, It is forbidden to buy or sell God's gifts. The scriptures say, Freely ye have received, freely give. It is best to give the gold to the poor. I live in the wilderness and have no use for it. With this he dismissed the nobleman's servants. People burdened with infirmities of every kind were brought to the wonder worker, whose prayers restored them to perfect health. For example, a young man was paralyzed in both legs by a demon. His family brought him to St. James and begged for his holy prayers. For three days the venerable one fasted and prayed, and the paralytic was healed. After blessing the youth, James commanded him to walk home. Realizing that he was held in the highest esteem by all, the man of God feared that he would fall into vainglory. Fleeing the praise of men, he abandoned his first cave and took up his dwelling in a second, by a stream about twenty miles from the city. For thirty years he lived there, praying and weeping night and day. In the beginning he sustained himself on plants that grew wild on the banks. Later he planted a small garden, where he worked for several hours each day to obtain his food. Eventually his fame spread so widely that monks from twenty or thirty monasteries, as well as many clergymen, began visiting him, seeking edification. Lay folk came in throngs to the cave for a blessing, prayers, and instruction in virtue. All received the spiritual prophet they sought. Even though this holy man was the repository of abundant divine power, he was permitted to take a grievous fall. Certainly, this occurred because he began to think highly of himself, considering that he had attained holiness in a God-pleasing life. The ancient adversary of mankind, envious of James's virtue and always digging traps for him, entered the daughter of a certain rich man and tormented her cruelly. The maiden cried, I will not depart unless you take me to James the anchorite. Her parents made the rounds of monasteries and hermitages until they found St. James. Falling at his feet, they begged, have mercy on our daughter who is being tortured by an unclean spirit. For twenty days she has eaten and drunk nothing, but continuously screams, tears at her flesh, and calls out your name. So fervently did the Blessed One pray for the maiden that the ground on which he stood trembled. After completing this supplication, the Venerable James blew on the girl and commanded the foul spirit, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, depart. As though scorched by fire, the devil fled. The girl collapsed and remained speechless until James prayed for her a second time. When she came to herself, the man of God lifted her up and delivered her into the arms of her mother and father. Seeing the miracle, the parents glorified God, but were afraid that the demon might enter their daughter again. Therefore, they entreated James to let her to remain with him for three days and recover her strength. To this the elder agreed. In relating the deeds of those who have attained perfection, we must tell not only about their virtues, but about the temptations they undergo at the instigation of the wicked devil, who sometimes succeeds in ensnaring them. Hearing how even holy men stumble, those leading a celestial life on earth are put on their guard, as we said at the beginning. We have spoken about the wondrous deeds of this elder. Now we must make known the storm that buffeted him, 
and also his grievous fall. But so doing, we will not hide the astonishing miracle he worked after fervently repenting. Verily, James's transgressions were as appalling as his earlier asceticism was laudable, but the distance he plummeted cannot be compared to the height to which he later ascended. Seeing that the man of God was alone in the wilderness with the maiden, the devil waited for a convenient time, then assaulted him with a hail of dissolute thoughts and unclean carnal desires. When the harlot was sent by the Samaritans, James burned his hand and controlled the passions. This time, the wonder worker and expeller of demons burned so fiercely with lust that he forgot the fear of God, his ascetical labors, and the gift of healing vouchsafed him by the Lord. Despite our father's advanced age, Satan vanquished him. Thus, James forced himself on the maiden and ruined her virginity, defiling himself and her and rendering useless all his self-mortification. Worse still, like a person slipping down a precipitous slope, tumbling from rock to rock and battering his body, James did not halt with this first crime. He added iniquity to iniquity, committing a second outrage. The enemy unnerved him with the thought that the girl would tell her parents about the rape, that he would be disgraced, and that retribution would follow. Reduced to fear and trembling, James killed the innocent girl, believing he could hide his first sin and avoid scandal. Then followed a third outrage, for the murderer did not bury the body, but heartlessly cast it into the stream. All this was the fruit of pride. If James had not thought himself a great holy man, he would not have suffered such a grievous fall and become in his old age a laughing stock to the demons, which he had held in derision and trampled from his youth. After James committed these atrocities, the devil began driving him like a prisoner of fetters to the ultimate pit of perdition, the worst offense of all, despair, the sin of Cain and Judas. The elder sat dejectedly in his cell, wondering what to do next. His conscience would give him no peace. He sighed continuously, he dared not pray, and he shrank from turning his thoughts to God. He pondered fleeing to a faraway land, returning to the world, renouncing monasticism, and laboring for the devil in his old age. At length he abandoned the cave and hurried on his way, lashed by a tempest of thoughts. In his mercy, Christ blotted out the sins of the whole world, and despite the elders' crimes, he who desires that no man perish, but that all be saved, looked down with compassion upon James. Intervening before the demon could claim total victory, our Savior arranged for the hermit's repentance and amendment. In accordance with the Lord's unfathomable judgments, James happened upon a monastery. Entering it, he greeted the abbot and brethren. They washed his feet and offered him bread, but he refused it. When they insisted he eat, James sighed repeatedly and groaned, Woe is me, the wretch! How can I raise my eyes to heaven? How can I call upon the name of Christ whom I have so grieved? How can I, a rapist and murderer, accept his gifts? And he confessed everything before the entire brotherhood. The superior and brethren were much disturbed by what they heard, but were also moved to pity. They consoled the elder and implored him not to despair, insisting that he remain at their monastery and repent. Nevertheless, he continued on his way back to the world. Providence next arranged his encounter with the holy anchorite, whose cell was not far from James's path. The monk persuaded James to visit with him, washed the elder's feet, and offered him food. Reproached by his conscience, the elder sighed from the bottom of his heart and beat his breast, but would not eat. Falling at James's feet, the brother lamented with the elder and swore that he would not rise until James agreed to share a meal with him. Finally, James relented, and the two men partook of such food as one might find in a desert cell, then rose to pray. Afterwards, the anchorite requested James, Father, say an edifying word about the life in Christ. Confirm your son's wavering heart, for I am troubled by many sinful thoughts. James moaned, then wept, and again beat his breast. Brother, leave me in peace to bewail my iniquities, he answered. I have greatly angered God, for in my old age I have been vanquished by the devil, and sullied myself like a youth. I am disgraced, bound for perdition, utterly lost. The passions I subdued as a young man have conquered me at the end of my days, and not only have I defiled myself with carnal sin, I have committed other unspeakable outrages. Hearing this, the brother was deeply troubled and begged the elder to relate how the evil one had defeated him. He did so for two reasons, so that the elder would be moved to repentance as he told the story, and to stir himself to increase vigilance as he listened to it. I led the ascetic life in the wilderness for more than fifty years, laboring for the Lord and struggling against the passions, began James. 
To preserve my purity, I burned off my fingers, as you can see. In his compassion, God deemed me worthy of abundant gifts of grace and worked numerous miracles through me, the sinner. Then a certain maiden fell under Satan's control. Her father and mother, hearing about the miracles I worked through the grace of Christ, brought the girl to me and requested my prayers. With God's help, I expelled the devil. The parents asked that I allow their daughter to remain with me for three days to recover her strength. I agreed. The parents left, and straightway I began to burn with carnal desire. My mind was blinded, and forgetting God, the fires of Gehenna, and my years of ascetic labor, I violated the maiden. Afterwards, the devil spurred me to worse atrocities. I murdered the girl and disposed of her body in a stream. Now, despairing of salvation, I have abandoned my cave and am on my way back to the world. Oh, how can I lift my eyes to heaven? I am certain that if I call upon Christ's name, fire will fall out of the sky and consume me. As he spoke, James shed rivers of tears and uttered piteous cries. The brother was moved to contrition, embraced the elder, and kissed him, saying, I plead with you, Father, do not give up your struggles. Do not lose hope of salvation. Believe in the power of repentance and confess your sins to God. The Lord is rich in mercy, and his compassion ineffable. If God disdained repentance, how would David, who fell into the pit of adultery and murder after receiving the gift of prophecy, have obtained forgiveness? If repentance and bitter tears were futile, how could St. Peter, to whom the Lord entrusted the keys to the kingdom of heaven, have secured pardon after thrice denying the Master during his voluntary passion? Indeed, after his repentance, the apostle was counted worthy of higher honor than before his fall, and was made chief shepherd of Christ's sheep. Therefore, let us repent while there is still time. Besides offering encouragement, the hermit urged James to remain with him. However, the elder refused. Fearing lest the elder perish in the slew of despondency, the anchorite fell at James's feet and pleaded that he reconsider, but to no avail. Lamenting bitterly and weeping, the brother finally let James go, giving him some food for the journey. He accompanied the elder for two miles, all the while exhorting him to repentance. Then, having embraced James and tearfully kissed him farewell, he returned to his cell. James continued on his way back to the world, but soon the voice of conscience prevailed. Leaving the path, he found a burial cave in which were old bones crumbling to dust. He pushed the bones to a corner and took up his dwelling there. Falling to his knees, he beat his breast, wailed, and prayed thus, How can I lift up mine eyes to thee, O my God? How shall I begin confessing my sins? How can I make entreaty with an unclean tongue and defiled lips? For which sin should I first ask pardon, for rape or murder? Forgive my crimes, O most kind master. Be merciful to me, the unworthy, O most compassionate Lord. Destroy me not on account of my foul deeds. I have defiled myself and shed innocent blood. I have cast away my victim's corpse in a stream, feeding it to beasts and birds. But now, O Lord, who knowest all things, I confess my transgression and beg forgiveness. Disdain me not, O Master, but in thine ineffable love for man, have mercy on me, the impious, vile one. Reveal thine infinite goodness and cleanse all of my sins. Do not allow the enemy to drown me in the abyss of iniquity. Do not permit the serpent to devour me in the bottomless pit. For ten years the blessed James repented, buried like a corpse in the sepulchre with dead men's bones and cut off from the living. Whenever anyone came there, the elder would say nothing to him, even if asked a direct question. Instead, he remained in the grave and spoke only to God, confessing his sins. He subsisted on the wild herbs growing in the wilderness, and of these he partook barely enough to prevent starvation. The whole ten years he spent weeping, sighing, and praying, shouting to God his transgressions and beating his breast. The all-compassionate, most merciful Lord, who desires not the death of the sinner but that he should return to life, accepted the elder's lengthy repentance. He heard James's lamentation and confession, forgave his offenses, and restored to him the gift of wonder-working. The first miracle James wrought after his repentance was the following. A hot, dry wind was scorching the land, which was already suffering from drought. The entire population was fasting and praying to God for rain. While matters were in this state, a voice from heaven spoke to the bishop of the town, a man of virtue. It said, In such and such a burial cave there lives a holy elder. If he prays for you, the wind will cease, the rain will fall, and the earth will bring forth her fruits. The next day, the bishop assembled the clergy and laity and announced the revelation, then led a procession to the sepulchre. 
The hierarch and his flock beat on the doors, imploring God's favor to show compassion and pray for them, so that the Lord would turn away his righteous anger and end the drought. But there was no reply from the grave, because James dared not lift his eyes to heaven and intercede for others. Instead, he continued beating his breast and repeating, Have mercy, O Christ, and forgive my grievous transgressions. For hours the bishop knocked while entreating the elders' prayers, but James did not respond. Finally, he and his flock returned to the city, downcast and weeping. They went directly to the cathedral where they performed a service of supplication. Outside, the dry wind was howling and hunger was stalking the land. Inside, the weeping crowd, although exhausted from fasting, cried out to God, and it came to pass that the celestial voice again spoke to the bishops, saying clearly, Go back to my servant James, whose presence I disclosed earlier. If he prays for you, the land will be saved from disaster. The bishop, his clergy, and the people returned to the tomb, and once more implored God's servant to pray for them. Finally, they forced the doors and carried out the saint. Unwillingly, the blessed James raised his eyes and hands and said a lengthy prayer. He had not yet completed his petition when the wind stopped and rain began pouring out of the sky. This came to pass because the Lord does the will of them that fear him, and his ears are opened to their supplication. On that day the words of the prophet were fulfilled. Then shalt thou call, and God shall hear thee, and shall say to thee, Behold, I have come. Astonished and overjoyed at the miracle, the bishop and his flock sang a triumphal hymn of thanksgiving and gladness to God and extolled the Lord's favorite, St. James. Every year thereafter they celebrated the anniversary of their deliverance from tribulation by God's mercy and the prayers of the blessed elder. Some time later, heaven directly revealed to the venerable James that his repentance had been accepted and his sins forgiven. He began to perform numerous miracles by the grace of Christ, curing diseases of every sort and casting out demons by a mere word. Within a short time, he had worked more wonders than in all the years prior to his fall and repentance. Before the year was out, it was made known to James that his end was at hand. He summoned the bishop and requested that he be buried in the sepulcher in which he lived. A few days later, James, the God-pleasing penitent, fell asleep in the Lord, and his holy soul took up its abode with the saints in the celestial land of divine blessings. The Venerable James was seventy-five years old when he died. Word of his passing spread throughout the region and drew to his funeral enormous crowds bearing candles and censers. The bishop presided over the rites and was assisted by all his clergy. Having chanted fitting dirges and anointed the holy remains with costly perfumes, they reverently buried the corpse in the sepulchre as a saint had directed. Later, the bishop erected a church outside the town and dedicated it to St. James. The honored relics were enshrined there, and a feast was celebrated annually in honor of God's favorite, our venerable Father James, and unto the glory of Christ God, who is praised forever with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen.